this came in from a viewer of ours. He's complaining about when he's pedaling, he can feel like some vibration feedback. I took it for a ride around the car park and definitely confirm that. It's not in the back wheel. It's definitely something to do with the bottom bracket. So we've taken everything out and tried to diagnose it. Now, he's running a Kogel uh, bottom bracket for PF41. Now Kogel build themselves as a bit like ceramic speed, but a little bit more durable, but they're still using aluminium cups and a ceramic bearing just with a bit of better weather sealing around the outside. Now, the mechanic that installed this, a little bit rude, absolutely no lubricant, no bearing retaining compound, nothing. Went in there completely dry, it's always a bad move. So initially I just thought it was undersized. You take our little Hambini gauges and the 40.95 goes in just a little bit. There is a taper on this and I've made some markings on here to try and help us understand what is going on. The drive side is quite similar. In fact, the drive side is actually in fairly good condition, albeit slightly undersized. The next clues is we look at the crank set and I put some red pen on here just to help you with the camera, but you can see the witness marks of the rotation where it goes light here, heavy here. And this is a new crank set, by the way, so this shouldn't really have witness marks on it already. Anyway, I've marked this red area here and on the drive side where those rotations are. So you can imagine that as we're pedaling, it goes light here and then it goes light here as well. Okay, so we have a bit of an alignment issue. I've tried to put some marks on here so you can get a rough idea, but these numbers aren't stupidly accurate. It's just to give you an idea of the average. So this is a 41 millimeter gauge. So I'm gonna set this at 41 millimeters here and zero it here. And we can put this in. Now, as we go in this direction, you can see it's getting very close to that mark, but generally something like 40.5. As we come further round, and you're gonna struggle with the camera a little bit here, uh, we go into the 40.9 and we start becoming a little bit oversized. Now, that's not that unusual, you might think. You think, well, okay, it's oversized here, a little bit undersized here, but we've also got another problem where this isn't actually that aligned. So, took our parallels and I've set these parallels to 40.5. So we've got a little bit of slack in this, remember. Now, put them in horizontally and they slide through beautifully, just as you'd expect. And you can't really get a gauge down there at all, really. But and where this little arrow is, and there's a gap about here, we can see how easily that goes in that, and then wiggle it in, and we suddenly have a gap here where we can get a 0.07 feeler gauge in. So this is also offset slightly in this direction. So that corresponds to the witness marks that we could see on there, obviously. So, solution. Okay, I feel like there might be quite a few questions stacking up, so let's just try and do a few of those. Now, first off, reason we're not using uh, internal micrometers like these is because this can be quite time consuming. We don't need to be that mega accurate with this. I'll explain that in a second. And also sometimes we just need a really quick and easy way to help us visualize things and even communicate that to a customer and the bore gauge does that for us. Now we set this end at 42 millimeters using various spacers and washers, then use a set of micrometers to squeeze this down to 41 and then set this gauge to zero which means that as we meet a restriction, we press into here, you'll see that we're measuring the amount that is going underneath 41. And as we release pressure on this, i.e. the bottom bracket might be getting oversized, that measurement gets bigger and bigger. So as we rotate this around the entrance to the bottom bracket, it's very easy to see sort of the ovalization effect taking place and to the extent in which it's happening. Again, it doesn't need to be mega accurate. These are normally used for measuring the inside of engine bores, um, but I think these really do highlight to us very quickly and to potentially customers um, what's going on with their bottom bracket. Now, and the reason I say this is not massively important because if we had fitted uh, a standard PF41 nylon bottom bracket, probably wouldn't be really noticing this. We wouldn't have a fantastic friction-free spin um, and there might be a little bit of creaking going on because everything is undersized. But generally speaking, the tolerances we're dealing with aren't that massive and the compliance in this material would probably deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. 
the reason this is becoming a problem is because of this Kogel bottom bracket. And that's because this has been machined so accurately and the frame hasn't been that we now have problems because there's nothing we can really compress. There's no compliance in the materials here. So that's why we're encountering these problems. Now, to try and fix this could be really, really difficult, but we're gonna use a Hambini bottom bracket and I'm gonna flip over to a little diagram I've got that'll hopefully explain that a little bit better. Okay, so nothing too technical here. This is Adobe Illustrator, it's a graphic design software, but you can just draw things really, really quite accurately and at least just visualize them. I think this might help. So first of all, this is the current drive side, which is pretty round, but quite undersized, 40.4. Um, and so that's one of our first problems to fix. Let me overlay the current non-drive side. This is the one that I've just shown you on the video where we've got that ovalization and the offset. So that's what the parallels are measuring that gap there. But we know across the horizontals, uh, it's all measuring pretty good. Now, quick flick back. The reason this isn't massively important because we're gonna fit this Hambini bottom bracket, our very, very first priority is to make sure that the holes are the right size so we don't get any of that compression effect. And that's what we're gonna try and fix first. And all we're gonna do is use our additional knowledge to try and help the alignment as we go because all of the alignment is really been doing with this. But with a little bit of thought, we can at least help things along the way. Okay, so here is the plan. First off, we are gonna bring the drive side up to spec, right up to its very limit. So this is the green circle. And if I get rid of that, that green circle, we are gonna be exactly 41. So really, really flirting with the outside limit of the tolerances. Now, as you can see, if I put the current non-drive side back on again, you see that's already starting to help take out some of these gaps, but this is also a little bit undersized. So. What I wanna do is bring the non-drive side up, but right on the very edge of its spec. So this is gonna be more like 40.81, 40.9. Um, and we might just get a little bit of a gap down here, but everything else should be helped along the way. Now, the reason I wanna do this is because one, we need to make sure things are the right size, so we're not restricting the bearing the spinning at all but also just bringing things back into alignment this way means that we're not forcing anything. So if anything, we're creating a gap rather than creating a, like a force that's gonna be uh, fighting against. After a lot of thinking, as you can tell, we've got around to fixing this. Now, I'm not putting all of this on camera. One, because I really want to take my time and think about it without the pressure of a camera being on me. But essentially, I've used a combination of a little bit of sanding, wet and dry, and using a honing tool as well, which I think you've probably seen Hambini use and I used on the channel before. Now this is great at getting a lovely smooth surface and trying to get something more circular. So what we've done is try to bring the drive side up to almost 41. I'll show you that in a second. On the, on the non-drive side, a little bit smaller. So we've got a bit more to play with. So remember our gauges, this is 40.85. This is now a slip fit, but Hambini 40.9 is still, it doesn't really go in. So on this side, remember, we're trying to bring it up to as close to 41 as we dare. And I did actually go slightly over here. There's a 0.3 and 0.5 here, but here's our 40.85 gauge. That's a slip fit as we expect. Our 40.95 is definitely a slip fit, but our 41 definitely not going in there at all. So happy with that. Now, because we're using a Hambini bottom bracket, which is all one piece, most of that alignment work has been done for us and we've just helped it out a little bit with our work here. And we're still in tolerances so that we know that we've got enough of a press fit to hold this thing in place, but it's gonna be loose enough to allow those bearings to spin exactly how we want. So the next job is to slide this thing in. So before we do anything, we're gonna give this a good clean with IPA, just because I've been using various things to keep everything lubricated as I sand and we can get rid of all those pen marks. And once we're clean, a bit of Loctite activator SF7471. And to fix this, we're using Loctite 603, which is a high strength retaining compound because remember we've gone right to our limit on this side at 41 and on this side we're between 95 and 98. So this is gonna be 
working well for us. A quick interlude then for the fascinating subject of Loctite. Now this is Loctite 603 we talked about in the video. Uh, we more commonly use Loctite 638 or Loctite 648, which the guys are using in the workshop right now, so we won't disturb them. Um, so let me flip into the data sheet and show you why we make these decisions, because here are the sort of the three common ones that we use. Now, Loctite 648 is probably the one we use most commonly in the workshop for like hub bearings and all that sort of stuff. All resistance, high strength, temperature resistance, and it's got a fairly high viscosity, which means that we can drip it on and let it run around and it doesn't just disappear all over the place. The Loctite 638, which is very, very high strength, and we really have to think very carefully about using that because it expands the gap fill there, you'll see it'll gap fill up to 0.25. Uh, also very high strength oil uh, resistance. It's also got a very, very high viscosity. So you almost need to um, smear it on a little bit. It doesn't run everywhere. The one we're gonna be using today is Loctite 603. And uh, the reason I want to use this is because uh, low viscosity, which means that we can use it as a lubricant to help um, push the bottom bracket in and it doesn't have much of a gap fill, but it's got enough for what we need it to do. Biggest thing really is the fixture time is 10 minutes. Uh, and that's really, really helpful when you're installing a piece like this because you've got some working time to play with, which I think is really, really helpful. Now, the reason we use in the fixative um, is because of the low temperatures. It's winter right here in the UK. The average temperature in the workshop is about 13, 14 degrees. So this is just gonna help that cure process and make sure we get a good bond. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Back to the fix. And let's get some retaining compound on there. Swipping back to the Hambini installation tool because our bottom bracket press isn't quite long enough to reach. lined up let's just get a little bit of grease on the shaft don't need to go mad That's how that should feel. When everything's aligned, it should be that smooth. Bit of a spin test. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very happy with that. Perfect. I'm so happy with that, apart from the annoying sound of the free hop. 